yeah, I'm just going to show this one slide quickly and then we'll switch to the actual GUI. Um, so just to uh, point out the installation instructions for Killsort, we did not have this as one of the homework problems, um, but the instructions are at the uh, GitHub repository and just so to sort of briefly summarize here, um, basically you're going to install CUDA and a version of Visual Studio um, compiler um, and you'll download the um, Killsort and a couple of other toolboxes and repositories. And if you uh, follow the instructions, uh, we think at this point, they are pretty streamlined and uh, everyone is successful with them without too much trouble. There are a lot of um, uh, hiccups of the process that we've ironed out at this point. Um, Marius has ironed out at this point. Um, and so if you follow these instructions, you should have no problem just uh, then going to the Killasort directory where you put the code and typing the word Killasort and pressing enter in MATLAB. So this is for MATLAB Killasort. Um, and actually, Marius, do you want to say is Python kill sort um, uh, an option for people at this point or not yet? Yeah, it is an option, but um, the only thing I would say is that it, it hasn't been tested very widely, um, not even by us. So uh, you could you could give it a try. We've it, it's worked very similarly to the MATLAB version for like you know a couple of recordings we tried, but I think uh, before I we release it more broadly, I, I'd like to see more more of it matching yeah. and, and by then it might be a different version of QS already so it's being used though in the international brain laboratory so IBL has used it some yeah 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 yep, great all right um so uh this uh command killsort should both um attempt to compile the CUDA code um and hopefully do that successfully and then we'll bring up the GUI um, and so then you'll be uh, ready to load your data set. And so let's, let me bring that up and show you what that looks like. And I will describe our features. Um, okay. So share screen again for this one. All right. Um, so now you should be seeing the um, kill sort GUI. And um, I will just sort of briefly walk through the few different things you select and then give you some pointers to some of the uh, controls to um, um, control what you're seeing in the GUI. And let me just, first of all, emphasize the main point of the GUI. The GUI is really intended as a launcher for Killisort. It's supposed to help you make sure that your data is being um, seen in the right way by Killisort, such that when you actually click run and when you run Killisort, um, it will execute correctly. Um, and so it's supposed to help you make sure that um, you have the basic parameters set up correctly and that the data is loaded correctly to um, be able to, to run through KillerSort successfully. So um, you're going to start up in the upper left with select data file um, and just browse to the path of the data file. If you use SpikeGLX to make a recording, this data file is going to be the .bin file. Uh, probably this is pretty small. Let me see if I, if I do this. Did, did the text appear bigger now a little bit? Um, hopefully it's readable-ish. Anyway, um, the uh, .bin file is, is the one you want to pick for this. Um, it will automa automatically populate the same directory as the working directory and the results output directory. Um, but if, for instance, um, your data file is on a server, then you could change the working directory to be a local hard drive, and that will speed up the processing. Um, so you could make this some temporary file on a local SSD would be the ideal case. Um, but then the results output directory could be back on the server, for instance, or you could make that a local drive too if you wanted to, um, up to you. But this is where the um, files generated by Killisort will end up. Um, so the next thing you want to do is pick up probe layout. Um, the default, um, I guess this is some, maybe somewhat confusingly named, but the default, if you're using a 1.0 probe, is going to be this um, NeuroPixels phase 3B1 uh, staggered. Um, so you would pick that one, and it will show uh, at that point um, the pro view here and uh, some data view. In this case, um, this is a uh, single shank neuropixels 2.0 probe, which is why I've got a single um, two two columns of sites that are aligned, uh, as as Marius mentioned and I had mentioned yesterday, on a 2.0 probe. The sites are aligned. Um, so this is showing me that it recognizes the channel layout, and I should be able to see that this is the channel layout I expect it to be, um, and it will try to guess the number of channels in your file for a NeuroPixels recording uh, recorded with SpikeGLX 
this should be 385. If you record with opening fizz, it's possible that this would need to be 384. Um, and it ought to be able to guess that successfully also, if that's the case, um, but you'll have to check. So the test of whether you got the right number of channels um, selected here, this is basically telling it how to parse the data from the file. So if you can see spikes in the view over here, then you got the right number of channels. And um, this recording is less intense with spikes than the one Mario showed, but what you're looking for is these little black and red um, splotches that are localized in time on the x-axis and space on the y-axis. The color value here is the voltage. Now, one of the controls I'll go ahead and tell you about is the um, is uh, to change between the color map view of the data, which is showing all of the channels by time for some little time segment here, um, and change to a traces view. So I just pressed um, C. Um, all of the controls um, can be seen by pressing this controls button here, and it'll pop up a little window that tells you what all the controls are. And now when we're in traces view, um, you can see I've it's now highlighted just a few of the channels on the channel map. Those are the ones we're seeing over here, and you can see a clear action potential here. So if you see some spikes that look like spikes, they remind you of what you saw when you were acquiring the data, then you're good to go. Um, and this has the, you've gotten the correct um, number of channels here because it's parsed it correctly. If it parses it incorrectly, you'll see some weird diagonal type structures and everything will look like noise and um, you'll need to try again um, on the number of channels. OK, um, sampling frequency for a NeuroPixels probe is 30 kilohertz. You want to leave that um, for a different probe type. Maybe you have a different acquisition system. You can still use KillSort for non-NeuroPixels probes. You'd have maybe have a different sampling frequency. Um, time range allows you to um, only run KillSort on a subset of the data. And um, in particular, you, uh, I would recommend that the first time you load up some data and run it, um, that you pick a small time range, like say zero to 100 seconds. So you type zero, 100, just like that. And this will just run it for the first 100 seconds of your data. Um, that won't be a useful run for analysis, but it'll allow the whole thing to run through and you can see whether any errors are produced or anything like that and sort of debug a little bit um, before you spend the you know, half an hour or an hour to run it through your whole data file. All right, the next um, parameter here is the registration. So Marius described this image registration approach that um, we have since KillSort 2.5. And you can see that the options here are described. Zero is no registration, so you can turn the registration off. One is the rigid registration, and N is um, for non-rigid non -rigid registration, you can choose how many blocks. And the one that we, the parameter setting that we investigated in the paper that seemed to work for our data sets was five. Um, and so that's the default. And um, as Mari showed for our data sets that we had tested in the NeuroPixels 2.0 paper, um, the non-rigid non registration was definitely working best, um, but certainly um, if you suspect that it's not working, you can try the rigid version. Um, okay, then um, the uh, threshold parameter can be adjusted. The threshold and Lambda and AUC for splits parameters, you should, by default, leave these all in place. You can read on the wiki about what exactly they do, um, but they're basically for um, tuning results. I think if you remember, Marius showed um, this sort of loop that you might go through of running kill sort and then uh, checking the results and potentially adjusting the parameters. To be perfectly honest with you, um, I myself never adjust any of these uh, parameters for any of my data sets. There was one situation with uh, um, a particular application we had where we were specifically trying to detect a particularly low amplitude kind of spike that we were adjusting the threshold. But basically, you should assume that these default parameters are very likely to be um, good for your data set. Um, and so I wouldn't, as a first step or even a second step, try adjusting these. But of course, you always can and see how it changes the results and look carefully um, at those, those outcomes. Um, there are other parameters, um, which you can click this set advanced options to get a description of how to set um, a view and set the other parameters, um, but those are even less likely to make a difference in your um, results, and so I would uh, skip those. Um, so that's all the parameters, and then once you've set once you've set those, which again, I think basically setting the data file and choosing the right probe layout should be it, um, you can literally then click run all and it will run. Um, and you can also do the, the multiple steps, pre-processing, spike sorting, and saving uh, independently if you want. Okay, so just quickly um, then on how um, to sort of look at the data a little bit in here. So the, um, the uh, gray bar here with the red line is a time axis, and you can click it to sort of jump around to different parts of the recording. Um, so you can make sure that all of the different 
time segments in your recording look similarly um, good, similarly lacking in noise. Um, you can use the, again, all of this is described in this controls button. Um, and you can also click help and you can also reset the GUI if something gets stuck. Um, so you can also uh, switch between what view of the data we, we're looking at. This is the whitened and high pass filtered view of the data. If I press um, one, I will get the raw data. Um, and so this, you can see, has lower frequency components in it. Um, and there's also some offset between all the channels. Um, and so maybe I want to press two to go back to the filtered data. Um, there's a, yep. a question from Marie that I think is useful. What version of KiloSort are we looking at right now? Um, so yeah, as Marius described, um, uh, this is this is um, not dependent on the version of KiloSort. So this GUI will look the same whether you're using um, two or two point five or three. I think. Um, yep. Yep. All right. Um, but yeah, probably I have two point five installed. So. Um, and that's basically it. So then you can um, see also the prediction. So after you've run the spike sorting, there will be a prediction here. Right now, all these traces are flat because the spike sorting hasn't been run. So it doesn't have any prediction about these spikes. And the residual, um, which should look flat after you run the spike sorting right now, it does not look flat because the residual, of course, is just the difference between the filtered data and the prediction. Um, so right now, that's the same as the filtered data since the prediction is zero. Um, but after you run spike sorting, you should look for this residual to be flat or empty. Um, and if we uh, go back to the color map view. This is where you can flip back and forth between those um, plots that Maria showed, where um, you can press two and four to flip back between filtered and residual, and hopefully you see the spikes disappear after the processing has been run. Um, okay, let me take questions about um, this GUI. I mean, it's really not any more complex um, than that. You're just gonna, again, set the data file um, make sure the data look like you see spikes over here and then click run all is basically the uh, approach here. So let me bring up the Q&A window. Uh, surprise you observe non-rigid shifts. What do you think causes that? Um, we think it's due to mechanical um, differences between brain regions. So literally the, the cortex is not mechanically rigidly connected to the, uh, the uh, hippocampus or structures below. So those can move differently in the brain. Um, Okay, I answered Michael's question a while ago. Um, what do the sharp peaks in registration before the manipulator movement correspond to? Um, okay, yeah, that's actually the same brain, that, that's real brain movements corresponding to the, this is, I guess, an old question, but this is real brain movements corresponding to um, uh, times when the mouse physically whistled, wiggled its body around and caused the uh, brain to move within the skull. Nick, I think you're um, answering already answered questions. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure why they showed up then. Um, this should be open seven right now. Okay, that is what I see now. Okay, so let me try. I'll check the timestamps maybe on the questions. So I see Soraya, Soraya just asked a question. Um, with the sampling frequency, if you use spike GLX to calibrate the sampling rate, should you use the calibrated sample rate in kill sort? Um, interesting question. I think it's going to depend. So basically what the sampling frequency is used for um, well, number one is to calculate the filters, although subtle differences between you know, 30 kilohertz and 30.01 kilohertz are not gonna materially affect the filters, um, but it's also used to give you spike times in seconds. Um, and so it depends on your synchronization strategy, whether you need those spike times in seconds to reflect the calibrated um, sampling rate or not. Um, so I'm not, I'm not certain, it would depend on your synchronization strategy. Um, what does the 10 and four mean for the threshold? Um, yeah, and, and uh, you have 32 channel probes. So yeah, so for 32 channels, definitely you don't want to use non-rigid registration and even the rigid, rigid registration may not have enough data to, to constrain the registration. So yeah, this registration is really intended for, for neuropixels probes where you have hundreds of, hundreds of sites in a row. Um, Marius, do you wanna address the 10 and four for the threshold and say something about what those mean exactly? Um, yes, I answered some questions about that. Uh, but basically, you should think of them as there, there's two thresholds beyond below which uh, you want to identify spikes. The first one wants to be high because we use that while we identify neurons. So we don't want to like corrupt our optimization with potential noise from below or cluster anything below. So that first threshold is high. The second threshold is low because you only use it once you've already found the clusters and their waveforms and their templates. We use the second threshold 
to try to find all the spikes from a given neuron. And now there's, there's less of a risk of contamination because by this point, we already know what the template should look like. So we can use that to reject that, that other noise. All right. Um, so let's quickly, uh, Cornelia says, uh, do you exclude parts of the recording, for, for instance, artifacts? You definitely can. Uh, it depends on how bad you think the artifacts are and whether they're, it's going to be a part of the recording you're never going to analyze anyway. Um, and then you could use the T range, the time range uh, parameter to um, exclude those segments. Or of course, you could use um, something like catchy T or your own code to cut them out before you start the processing. Can you look at different areas of the probe, says Lauren? Okay, yeah, that's uh, a good point. So uh, let me just show that real quick. So if I go back to the uh, traces view, so right now it's selecting that part of the probe. And if I just click on different parts, then I can see different parts of the probe. So it's as simple as that. Um, and when I'm in the color map view, all the channels are green. That's because I'm seeing all of the channels over here. Um, okay, um, any of these look urgent? Let's see. Um, we talked about time ranges, excluding channels. So um, Mariana, you can exclude channels by specifying a different channel map. Um, so you can do that programmatically. Uh, in the GUI, you can only exclude channels by um, right-clicking them one by one. That's the way to exclude them. And you see they change color over here to indicate that they've been excluded. Um, and you can right-click to add them.